Good morning, Shannon Oaks family. And we truly, truly are a family. Um, you know, for, for us to stop and pray for Ella, uh, that was good. And I know during this service, you feel free anytime during my sermon just to pray for Bradley and Melissa's parents. Uh, you just, we're a family, and, and that's what we're about here at Shannon Oaks. Speaking of that, uh, just a minute ago, Jonathan kind of introduced you to something that's happening. And what I'd like to do is, I'd like to uh, share with you guys this morning that we have cards that are in every bulletin. And there's a reason for those cards, speaking of family. And that is, we want to know if you are here with us. And so, if you would, if you're a family that's a member here, please fill out the card. If you are here this morning and you are a guest, we would love to have you fill out the card. Jose, my, my slide is not up there for some reason. I'm not sure why. Thanks, brother. Okay. So, this morning, we are going to be... Uh, having a Connect luncheon at 11.30. And Jonathan mentioned that just a minute ago. If you are a guest for the first time, please just come on over there. We're just going to share our vision of who we are, opportunities for ministry, and how you can join our church. So if you're a guest, come on over and just have lunch with us. We'll be done by 12.30. You'll be on your way, but we'll love having you. So please, if you haven't signed up yet, come on. We'd love to have you. The other thing I want to tell you that we're really excited about is we're really excited about our Gospel of John study. I've got, the, I've got the slides, brother, okay? The Gospel of John study. We have been having some folks here saying we would really like to study just a book of the Bible on Sunday morning during uh, nine, the 9 o'clock hour. And so Sam Severe, who led our communion this morning, is going to be starting this study on October the 17th. And so if you would like to dig in to uh, one of the Gospels, in fact, we're going to be preaching from that Gospel this morning. If you'd like to dig in to the Gospel of John, we welcome you to start coming on the 17th at 9 o'clock in the morning. We'd love to have you be a part of that. We're in a series right now called Real You. And it's the idea that when you look in the mirror, as a believer in Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, what should you see? And so in week one, we see in Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love. In week one, we said what we ought to see is a person filled with agape love who seeks the highest good of another. We see that joy is another part, that we have a joy because we know we've already won the victory. And it just kind of exudes out of us. We have peace, a peace that passes all understanding. No external circumstances can take away that peace. And then we have what we call patience, or we might want to call it a patient persistence. And that is, we have within us patience that endures. Then we said we also are people that are filled with kindness and goodness, and we combine those together. And then last week, we talked about how we are people who are faithful. This morning, we're going to come to another aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. It's the aspect of gentleness, the aspect of gentleness. Now, the actual Greek word is the word prephis, and the Expositor's Greek New Testament gives us this definition of preface. It's when we walk in the Spirit and we understand that the outcome of our life is truly humility. That the outcome of our life is one who walks in humility. In contrast to that is one who walks with pride, one who walks with arrogance. This morning, we're going to see those don't come from God. Let's, uh, let's pray together before we dig into our text this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and we are uh, so uh, moved at, at the text we're going to study. 
God, I just, I prayed all night last night that you would help me with this very, very important text. God, may I just get out of the way this morning. Uh, may your word come forth with power. May we leave different than we came this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When Muhammad Ali defeated Sonny Liston for the heavyweight championship of the world, he boarded a plane to fly across America. And the plane was just about to take off, and the stewardess came by, and she said, Excuse me, sir, you need to put on your seatbelt. His reply to the stewardess was, Superman don't need no seatbelt. She paused for a second, and she looked at him. She said, Sir, Superman don't need no airplane. (laughs) Have you ever been put in your place before? Have you ever got a little too filled with yourself before? Maybe pride or arrogance, or maybe you're just thinking, I can do it all on my own. Well, this morning we're going to come to a text where Jesus is going to have that kind of conversation with his disciples. We're going to be in John chapter 13 this morning, if you want to open your Bibles, and we're just going to park there today in John 13. and We're going to unpack verse 1, and man, is it a verse. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, let's just begin with the first few words. It was just before the Passover. If you know your Old Testament, the Passover was the last of the plagues that came to Egypt when the the firstborn male would die as the death angel came over the homes. But for the Israelite, it was a a time of redemption and deliverance and freedom from bondage. For if they would slay the lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost, the death angel would pass over them. And sure enough, that's what happened. And they were free. And they were led out of bondage. Jesus, as he comes to this upper room, knows that it's time for Passover. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus, this is what John the Baptist said in John 1, 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus knew at Passover that he was to be that Lamb. I just need you to stop what you're doing right now, and I just want you to focus on Jesus. What must have Jesus been feeling at that moment? Passover's in the air. He's gathered together with those that he loves, and he is to be the lamb that's going to be slain. Have you ever had a couple of events in your life ever converge on you like that and just overwhelm you? My... My son, Chandler, is always telling me, Dad, watch this. Mom, watch this. Watch this. And we're, Talisa and I, I I watch sports. Talisa reads books. We're not big TV watchers. But he says, Dad, you've got to watch this series. It was called Parenthood. Now, this was in 2016. The series was already over. And he set up a way where we could just binge and watch it. And so for date night, for several months, we would watch two or three episodes and just watch Parenthood. And I was hooked. I come from a big family, five boys. When we gathered together at Thanksgiving, there'd be 30 or 40 people every Thanksgiving in our home. This was the story of a family called the Bravermans. And the rock-solid man, the father, the patriarch, was Zeke Braverman. And you watched this series, and what you saw, you saw everybody in your family. 
you know, the dysfunctional ones, you think, I'm not dysfunctional, but yeah, I've got some dysfunctional relatives. Well, they're in this show. You saw your sibling. You saw your sister-in-law, your brother-in-law. You saw your nieces. You saw your nephews. And so we watched it. 103 episodes. We got to 102, and I wasn't ready for 103. Mm. You see, on December 31st, 2015, my father passed away here in Sulphur Springs. And that whole week of, after Christmas, I was the sibling he turned to. And he would have a list every day. And he would say, Jeff, I need you to do this, 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 this. We talked about his funeral. I mean, no man had a funeral laid out like my dad did. Every song he wanted sung. Every, and Jeff, you're going to do the funeral. Not your brothers. You're going to do it. And after I'm gone, this is what I need you to do with mom. And just, it was day after day after day after day. And then dad passed away on New Year's Eve 2015. And so when episode 103 came up in the summer of 2016 and Zeke Braverman died and they closed out the series with a six-minute video set to music, church, I wasn't ready for that. I didn't cry at the funeral because I was the minister in charge. I didn't cry when my dad died because I was the sibling that was in charge and I'd stuffed all this inside of me for six months, and it just overwhelmed me. Have you ever been there? Maybe it's a story. Maybe it's a book. Maybe it's an event. Maybe it's a movie. Maybe it's a sermon. And whatever you got stuffed inside of you, something else comes in. It overlaps that, and you're just overwhelmed. Jesus is at that moment here. He is the lamb to be slain. It's more than that, though. His hour has come. What does that mean? you got to know that in 12 to 15 hours, Jesus is going to be dead on the cross. From 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., Jesus is going to go through six trials. Six. Three by the Romans and three by the Jews. Jesus is going to have a crown jammed on his head made of thorns. Jesus is going to go through a gauntlet of soldiers who take something like a cane and beat him on the head. Jesus is going to have a whip lined on the end with jagged bone Slashed on his back 39 times. Jesus is going to be put on a cross and have nails put in the hollows of his wrists and a spike through his feet. He's going to have a hard time breathing. And in this upper room, he knows all that's coming. And all, everything is just intersecting and he's just overwhelmed at that moment. And then, all of a sudden, in the middle of the dinner, he gets up. Charles Wendell is one of my favorite preachers. He preaches in Frisco, Texas for Stonebriar Community Church. I've been over to, to hear him. I, I just love the guy. And when he preaches John 13, he actually turned to his church and he said this. He said, why did he get up in the middle of dinner? And then Swindoll takes them to Luke 22, 24, where it says, A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. It was like a shouting match. 
Who's going to be the greatest? It would be like if you were at the foot of your mom or dad's bed as they're having their last few moments with you. The family's all around, and all the siblings are arguing over the estate. Can you imagine how that would break the heart of your mom or your dad? That's what's going on right here. And what's really sad about this, when you think about this, Jesus has invested three years of his life in these guys. Not only has he spoken things to them, he's shown them. But just look at a couple of things that he has spoken to them. Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest And here they are arguing about who's going to be the greatest. He has modeled. He has taught. Guys, it's not about you. What about this one? Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, Anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. I'd like to invite you this morning to take your bulletin, open it up. And I just want us to leave here this morning with three really important points that I want us to try and live out this week. By the way, as you walk out, if you're a guest here for the first time, uh, we have at our connect table outside and also at the giving tables, we have these lanyards, and we practice every week living out whatever I'm preaching. We, we, We memorize a verse. Just grab one as you live. We hang them in our cars so wherever we go, we remember who we are and whose we are. The first thing I would like to invite you to write down this morning is this. Humility is unannounced. It's unannounced. Isn't it amazing? How would you have reacted had you been Jesus? What would you have done at this dinner? Well, this is what Jesus did. He got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing. He wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin. And he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Why was he doing this? Because they had dirty feet. You see, this was the custom. Whenever you came into a room to have supper, a servant would be there, and the host would provide the servant that would wash your feet. There's no host here. And so the tradition was the first one who came in the house, if there was no host, that first person then would wash the feet of the others. Disciple number one said, nope, not me. Disciple number two said, not me. Disciple number three said, not me. Not one of those 12 men was willing to do what was a custom in that time. Not one. And so Jesus doesn't announce it. He doesn't make a big deal out of it. Jesus simply shows them what it means to be a servant. He demonstrates what it means to be. Who we really are. Jesus has asked you and I to be servants. And when we leave today, I hope that is what is on your hearts. But not to be servants who announce it. If you want to read about that, just go later on and read Matthew 23. And you can read all about the leaders in Jesus' day. Oh, they were servants. As long as they got the big billboard sign, as long as the name was on the scoreboard at the college football stadium. That's the kind of servants they were. Jesus says, we are the people who serve unannounced. Secondly, humility receives without embarrassment. It's interesting when he comes to Simon Peter, his reaction. Let's look at it together. Simon Peter's reaction to Jesus bending down with the basin, taking Peter's dirty feet and washing those dirty feet. Here is Peter's reaction. He came to Simon Peter 
who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. I love to read commentators on this comment. One said, this is nothing more than self-asserting pride. Another says, at first glance, it looks like Peter's really, really humble. But what we have here, now listen, this is great. We have pride that refused to admit one has dirty feet. It is the pride that hides under the garments the truth about our lives. It is the pride that keeps us from being vulnerable, from being exposed. It's hard to admit when you have dirty feet. I can just lay this aside right now. If you're a visitor here, this is a church with dirty feet. But we have a Savior who forgives us, whose blood covers us, and when God sees us, he sees righteousness. But what this point ought to tell us is this. If you and I are people who want to hide under our garments and want to act like we have it all together, we're going to miss out on the greatest blessing of all. And that is to receive from someone else when we come forth in brokenness. Have you ever been in a situation when you were in need, even on the smallest thing, and you say, no, 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 I got this covered. I don't need your help. This morning, 5.55, I'm at the Shell gas station. There's not many people at Shell at 5.55. I go in. I'm just going to, I got to just bear my soul with you here. I go in to buy a five-hour energy because I didn't sleep last night. I buy two. So at least it looks better on my credit card. You ever feel that? You ever feel that? Well, you know, you know, two is better than one. You know, six dollars is better than three dollars. So I buy two. I see the attendant there is messing with the credit card machine, and he turns it upside down. He's looking at. It. I go, oh my! And all of a sudden he unplugs it. And he plugs it back in, and he says, uh, "Oh, that's two. Okay, it'll be six dollars." I said, "Well, here's my credit card." He said, "It'll probably be five or ten minutes before it's ready." I said, "It's okay." Our preacher recently preached on patience. And uh, I, I, I can be patient. I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. Okay, God, here, I'm going to be patient. A Sulphur Springs Police Department officer walked up, and he said this. He opened up his wallet, pulled out $6. And he says, I got you covered. Now, let me tell you my reaction. First of all, I'm embarrassed that I don't have any cash in my wallet. And my reaction is to say, hey, man, I can wait five, ten minutes. It's okay. That's my reaction. But you know what that would have done to him? That would have taken away his opportunity to bless me, and it would have shown my pride. You got that? Brokenness receives. Brokenness accepts. And maybe one of the things you need to think about is, I've got dirty feet and I'm having a hard time, well, maybe the problem with you is this. That if you would confess your dirty feet, you would have a family here that would love you and surround you and bring you into wholeness, would support you as you came forward. Maybe that's why you're still struggling with dirty feet. You've never admitted it. That's what the church is for. Isn't that right, church? We are here to support each other and love each other, and that is not where Peter was. We're about to have a connect luncheon over here. One of the things we're going to have, we're going to have our leader of life groups talk. And I just want to tell you, if you're not in a life group, I hope you'll join one. Because that's a great place where we can share our dirty feet and support each other and love each other. The third thing I want you to write down this morning is this. This is tough, guys. This is tough. Humility is not selective. It says that Jesus, when he'd finished, he had washed all 
their feet. Whose feet did he wash? Well, he washed a guy who was about to deny him three times. He washed his feet. He washed a guy who was going to doubt him. He washed the feet of all these people except for one who was going to abandon him. And then he washed the feet of one guy who was going to sell him out for $6,000 of today's money. Sell him out. So I've got a question for you this morning. Have you come to a point in your walk with the Lord? Because the Holy Spirit can help you get there. That's what's promised here in Galatians 5. Have you come to a place in your walk where you wouldn't pass by anybody's feet? Is there someone you know you would refuse to wash their feet? Jesus says his followers inspired by the Word of God, encouraged by each other, and filled with the Holy Spirit can wash anyone's feet. You see, what this text is about, it's about Jesus telling you what you need to do. I'm just going to read this to you. Listen to how he closes it out. It's not even going to be on the screen. Just listen. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now, I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is commanded by our Lord. But he's given us the Holy Spirit to make this happen. So think about the three points we talked about this morning. I'm going to serve others with no announcement. I'm going to receive and become vulnerable to other people. I'm going to be open to people. I'm not going to hide behind my garments. I'm going to admit I've got dirty feet. And then I'm going to serve Others, regardless of my feelings about them. Let me tell you, if the people in this room would do that, it would totally, incredibly, magnificently impact your life and the kingdom and all those who are around you. So why do we struggle with that? It's the same thing these guys struggle with. It's the battle for self. It's the battle to focus on self. It's the battle to think that if I focus on self and I go for it, it's going to fill me up. And that's all a lie. I want to close with a story by the same person that we started with, Muhammad Ali. It was just before Ali got Parkinson's disease and right after he'd retired from boxing. The Sports Illustrated writer Rick Riley went out to interview him at his magnificent farm in Michigan. Muhammad Ali took Riley out to a barn. And when they opened the barn doors, Riley was shocked at what he saw. On the ground, in the dirt, in the mud, was every one of Muhammad Ali's trophies, pictures, and championship heavyweight belts. Pigeon dung had covered most of them. Ali turned to Rick Riley and said this, I had the world, and it ain't nothing. Let me tell you what Jesus tells us. Jesus says this, Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. I just want to invite you on a journey with me for the next nine months. Let's just do this together. Let's just lose ourselves in Jesus. 
Let's lose ourselves in our love for God and our love for the Holy Spirit. Let's lose ourselves in our love for our spouses and our kids and our friends and the unlovable. Let's just lose our life and empty ourselves into Jesus. If we will do that, this is the promise we have from the Lord. You will be blessed. This morning, as we do every Sunday, we're going to offer you a chance to come forward for prayers. Was there anything in the message this morning that hit home with you? I mean, is there anything that you're holding on to that this morning the Word of God converged on your story and you felt that emotional ding? Have you been leaving work or home with something heavy on your heart and on your shoulders? Don't leave this place with that. We invite you to come forward this morning and just, just pray with us this morning. And leave free. We, we've been singing about that. How moving were those songs this morning when we said we are free. We are free indeed. It is true. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can come this morning and do that. And then you can follow up and be baptized. The baptism is right over here, a baptismal area. And we can baptize you this morning. You know, I mentioned some things a minute ago. I mentioned we can lose ourselves in our marriage. Have you been doing that? Men, have you been treating your wives like they're the queen of your house? Wives, have you been loving and supporting and treating your, your husbands like they're the king of the house? Have you been focusing on the needs of your kids? Have you been loving? Have they seen inside of you Jesus? Do any of you guys need this morning to come forward and say, man, I just need a new start in my life. We're going to sing a song together. If you need to come for any reason, we're going to have prayer teams down here. We invite you to come right now as we stand and sing. Please come this morning.